Okay, returning to the topic of preterism. In the last installment in this series, I covered the history of preterism from the early days of the Reformation through the so-called Age of Enlightenment and onward into the 1800s when Universalists and others brought the doctrine to the United States. You had guys such as Moses Stewart and Robert Townley, for example, bringing that doctrine to America. But the guy I'd like to focus on in this installment is Robert Townley. And I mentioned him briefly in my last installment, but by way of review, Robert Townley was a British minister who wrote the very first known full preterist book. Shortly after publishing his book, he went from rejecting and speaking against universalism to converting to it and even pastoring a universalist church in Boston, Massachusetts. Universalists and Unitarians were the biggest adherents to preterism at that time, and we're going to discuss why that is. In covering the German rationalists, we found that they doubted the divine inspiration of Scripture. They felt they were qualified to create things such as Jefferson's Weight Watchers version of the Bible and write off the supernatural parts as just pure superstitious nonsense. These same guys, these German rationalists and the like, jumped on preterism like ducks on a June bug because if Revelation spoke strictly about past events, then they could discount the prophetic nature of the apocalypse and just write it off as human invention. This was the stance of the Unitarians, and most of the so-called founding fathers of the United States Republic were Unitarian, on top of being rationalists and deists and Freemasons and the like. And I think this is important to remember, because while the unanimous eschatological view of the Reformation was historicism, we not only find the Reformation petering out simultaneous to the rise of futurism and preterism, but we also find the rise of humanism, Judaism, and Romanism among Protestants simultaneous to those views. This is hardly a coincidence. I've said it before, but I'll say it again because it bears repeating. The Reformation was unstoppable as long as they had the unifying view of historicism. And I know some will say that correlation doesn't equal causation, but I think you can use this as a barometer of the overall strength and direction of the Reformation and the Protestant believers at that time. When historicism was that unifying view, Rome was brought to its knees, was all but vanquished. But thanks to the futurism of Ribera, and the preterism of Alcazar starting to truly take root in the 1800s, that front was eroded, and eventually the Reformation wound to a halt, and that gave Rome a chance to reassert its influence, and futurism and preterism became the favored eschatologies of ecumenicists who wanted to undo all the work of the Reformers and thus throw dirt on the memories of the literally tens of millions of Protestants who were murdered for the cause. Frankly, I think it's shameful. It's sad, it's downright embarrassing that we would do this to our spiritual forebears. So much for honoring our fathers and our mothers. We've spit on their graves and run into the arms of the very people who persecuted them, imprisoned them, tortured them, and murdered them. If you haven't read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you should. And then look me in the eye, or better yet, look yourself in the mirror, and say that everything those brave men and women stood for should be tossed out the window like so much trash. Men and women who had more manhood and courage in their little fingers than most or any of us have in our entire bodies today. I dare you. I dare you. When we look at the great things accomplished in ecclesiastical history after the passing of the apostles, we don't find anything, a fraction, as significant as the Reformation. And the Reformation ran on the rails of historicist interpretation of prophecy. The Futurist Movement helped facilitate the Zionist Movement, which is about as big as the Reformation but proportionately destructive, and the Preterist Movement has next to nothing to show on that scale, either good or bad. If we look objectively at the fruits of the three eschatologies, we find historicism is hot, 
Futurism is cold, but preterism is distinctly lukewarm. I sincerely believe Jesus Christ will spew full preterism out of his mouth, vomit it, and spit it out like the bad sulfur-laced poison it is. Preterism doesn't have anything to show for itself on a par with either the Reformation or Zionism. The most it has is a bunch of wackos like Max King or Don Preston or, well, other guys even crazier than them. Anyway, I digress. I say let the dead bury themselves in radical heresies. But bottom line, if we're going to go off the fruits of the three eschatologies, preterism is the lukewarm loser begging for a participation trophy. It was nothing but a fringe eschatology embraced by a few cranks until it suddenly started getting popular within the past 60 years or so, and this should be a clue. At least futurism has a longer history of popularity than that. Granted, not by much, but I'll give credit where credit is due, however little credit that might be. Here's a little hint. The newer the doctrine is, the more skepticism we should give it. Because what did Paul say in 2 Timothy 3.13? He said, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That means as time goes on, the deceptions and lies will get worse. So if we take his warning seriously, then the more recent the doctrine is in its origin, the more removed its origin is in time from Christ and the apostles, the more skeptical we should be about it. We should eye it warily especially if the ones who originated it were contrary to God, such as the German rationalists and humanists and such like. We're 2,000 years removed from the preaching of Christ and the apostles, and when a new doctrine comes along and starts taking off that far away from Christ on the historical timeline, we need to be very, very careful with it. History, people. History is important, especially in this case. And when some wackadoodle tells you to ignore history and just go with whatever he tells you, you'd better start cracking all the history books you can get a hold of. A real teacher encourages you to learn. A false teacher needs you ignorant, and he'll do whatever he can to keep you ignorant because once you start breaking out of that ignorance, he's through. He's done. His ego can't afford that. His pocketbook can't afford that. Beware of the so-called teacher who doesn't want you learning on your own and won't abide any question. And as I said in the last installment, the only excuse for ignorance in the information age is laziness. Don't be lazy. There's no room for the lazy and the complacent in the kingdom, guaranteed. Don't rely on someone else to tell you what is or what is not. Go do your own legwork. Anyway, going back to Robert Townley and his universalism. The question needs to be asked, why do universalists love preterism? Why did Townley go from repudiating universalism to preaching it within a year's time? And I might add, he's not the only full preterist who's gone this route. Before going any further on this, I just want to define universalism for the listener. When I speak of universalism in this context, I'm talking about the belief that everyone, whether good or evil, will ultimately spend eternity in glory with God and generally universalists hold that punishment, if there is a punishment, is a temporary thing meant to reform the wicked, not destroy them. Now, I don't intend to get too involved refuting universalism in this installment, though the refutations of universalism are many of the same ones against full preterism, but I do intend to explore how it is that universalism and full preterism go together like Harry Dunn and Lloyd Christmas. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? All prophecies been fulfilled. All prophecies been fulfilled. Guys, guys, guys. Okay, so first of all, remember, full preterism, including the fanatical brand I've been countering in this series, holds that absolutely all prophecy has been fulfilled, no exceptions. That means when you read Revelation, every single prophecy from the first verse of chapter 1 to the last verse of chapter 22 is 100% fulfilled, over and done. The end. Nothing remains written in Scripture to be fulfilled. That's their stance. So with that in mind, let's take a look at chapter 20 of Revelation. We'll start in verse 11. It says, 
Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, according to the full and fanatical preterists, every word of this scene was fulfilled when Jerusalem fell to Rome in 70 AD. There are several issues that arise from this, but I want to focus mainly on verse 14. We've read about the resurrection and the judgment of the dead, and then we read in verse 14 that death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire, along with anyone who is found guilty in the judgment. The word death is pretty straightforward, but Hades, or Hades, is a Greek word which corresponds with the Hebrew Sheol. Both speak of the grave or the state of being dead. And we can see that both death and the grave or the state of being dead are cast into the lake of fire. This corresponds with 1 Corinthians 15, 26, which says the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Revelation 20, verse 14 is speaking of the end of death, the abolition of death and everything associated with death. The wicked are destroyed, and so is death. If there are no more wicked, no sinners, nobody earning the wages of sin, then death isn't needed anymore. It's exhausted its usefulness, and it's discarded. Now, I want to ask you to think about this very carefully, very logically. I have to give Robert Townley credit, because as a full preterist, at least he was consistent in his interpretation of Revelation. You can't hold the full preterism, and also believe in a judgment or second death for the wicked. You can't. If all, and I mean all prophecy, all of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD, then, logically, the judgment of the dead took place in 70 AD. Death and the grave were destroyed in 70 AD. So therefore, judgment after death, death as the wages of sin, all that was fulfilled and accomplished in 70 AD, which can only logically mean Nobody has been judged or faced the second death or will be judged or face the second death since that point in history, since 70 AD. It's all been said and done. Damnation is a thing of the past. And if damnation is a thing of the past, then the gospel falls completely into irrelevance. The only thing that's left is everyone, whether good or bad, gets eternal life. Everyone whether good or bad, spends eternity with God in the Gnostic heaven, presuming we can even find the idea of anyone going to heaven anywhere in the Bible, which we can't, but that's a discussion for another day. Argue all you want. But this is the only logical way, the only consistent way to follow through on full preterism. See, Robert Townley converted to universalism because he was faced with a choice either hold to his inconsistent view of preterism or give up preterism altogether or follow full preterism to its only logical conclusion. I suspect he was probably too invested in full preterism to give it up because he'd written an entire book advocating it and it would be a bit embarrassing to recant it, so universalism it was. Now, if you're a full preterist, you need to face this dilemma head on. You need to either reject full preterism or embrace universalism. It's the only consistent approach. At least Robert Townley had the cranial capacity to realize if he was going to hang on to his full preterism and never let go, then he of necessity had to become a universalist or he'd be utterly inconsistent with his doctrine. I'm not saying he was consistent with scripture. I'm saying he was consistent with his eschatology. To be consistent with his eschatology, then he had to say that at some point the tares were all gathered into the barn with the wheat because after 70 AD there's no destruction for the tares. Death and Hades are abolished. 
so there's only one place for them to go, the barn, right alongside the wheat. The parable of the sower only applied to people pre-70 AD. Do you see the problem here? The parable of the sower is just one example of how full preterism severely, and I mean severely, limits the Bible's relevance in the modern era. So many of the things written in the Gospels and the Epistles just don't apply to the post-70 AD world. It isn't our mail. This is dangerous because we end up with a mentality an awful lot like the rationalists and the Thomas Jeffersons who deleted the Bible passages they thought were no good. Think about this for a moment. When we read about Christ instituting communion or the Lord's Supper, Christ is very clear that it's through this practice that we remember his death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.26 that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, We do it to declare the Lord's death until he comes. That's how we remind ourselves and others of his sacrifice. But if Christ came in 70 AD, communion is irrelevant. It's out of the question. It's superfluous. Paul and Christ both said that the purpose of communion is to remind ourselves of Christ and his death. Paul said we practice it until he comes. Why until then? Because when he returns, we will see him as he is, according to 1 John 3, 2. He'll be in front of us. We won't need reminders. But the full preterist says Christ has already returned. In fact, 1 John 3, 2 says we shall be like him. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have that new incorruptible body, and neither does anyone else on the face of the earth today. So according to full preterist logic, That promise must have been limited to those who were alive or were resurrected in 70 AD. What that means is, communion was only meant for people prior to 70 AD, and it lost all its relevance afterward. Post-70 AD, we don't get to be like him with bodies changed in the twinkling of an eye. We don't see him as he is. Communion is a joke for anyone post-70 AD. Everything it represented is over and done. We don't even get to be reminded of him. It's all irrelevant. All the passages speaking of communion aren't addressed to us. It wasn't meant for us. Stop taking communion. In fact, though I'm not a preterist in any sense whatsoever, I would personally urge full and fanatical preterists to stop taking communion. Not only because it's inconsistent with their eschatology, but and I'm going to get in trouble with this, I'm sure, but because their theology denies key aspects of the Christian faith, whether they recognize it or not. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, lists what the writer of the book calls the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The foundation of Christian doctrine, in other words. Let's take a look at them. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let's go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. I want you to notice that the author of Hebrews speaks of the foundation of the Christian doctrine. That means the basics, the things the Christian faith is built on, the elementary doctrines babes in Christ should know. In this passage, the author wants the reader to move past those things to advance and grow. And he says these basics, these foundational doctrines include the following principles. Repentance, faith, baptism or immersion, laying out of hands, the resurrection, and eternal judgment. These are the building blocks of the doctrine of Christ which Paul and the apostles were preaching. The full and fanatical preterists would say the resurrection and eternal judgment as listed in Hebrews 6 and as described in Revelation 20 are done and irrelevant today, which means they're kicking out these elementary principles of the gospel. Once they do that, they've changed the doctrine of Christ. They've started preaching another gospel. It's no longer the gospel the apostles preached. It's no longer the Christian gospel in even the most basic sense. And if they've tossed out baptism or immersion as well, as many of them have, then they've degenerated the doctrine of Christ by a full 50%.
And if they've embraced universalism, then they're kicking out repentance as well. It's just a twisted mockery of the gospel. And what does Paul say in Galatians 1 about those who preach another gospel? I know we read this in a previous installment, but it's well worth reading again. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Notice, Paul says this twice. Okay, they didn't have bold or italics back then, so the only means of emphasis in writing was to repeat things. This was an especially big deal because at the time, writing parchments and the like were expensive, so saying something twice meant filling up valuable space. If Paul repeated this statement, he felt it was worth it to make extra sure his readers knew he was dead serious about this. So when we have teachers today eliminating the basic principles of the doctrine of Christ, which we find listed in Hebrews 6, we have teachers preaching a different gospel. And where we find men teaching another gospel, we find men who've perverted the gospel and men who are accursed. In the first verse of that chapter, Paul says the gospel he taught was not by men, but by Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only one who can deliver a change to the gospel, any change whatsoever, as we find it, taught by the apostles, is Christ himself. Only he can make any changes to it. And nowhere in the Bible do we find any record at all of him amending the gospel he gave to the apostles and the apostles gave to us. Nowhere. He doesn't even say, hey guys, after Jerusalem falls, things are going to be different and here's how things are going to be. He doesn't say anything like that. This is extremely important because if we change any of the principles of the doctrine passed from Christ to the apostles to us, we are accursed. That's anathema in the Greek. The same word used for anyone who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, anathema. Paul says, if anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, accursed. And if anyone has the gall the audacity, the arrogance to change the message of Christ. Can you honestly say they love the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll let you decide on that one. This is dangerous territory, to say the least. Think about Achan when Jericho fell. I have no doubt he participated in marching around the city every time he was supposed to, in the way he was supposed to, shouted when he was supposed to, he helped sack the city as he was supposed to, he did everything he was supposed to do except for one point. He changed only one point. I don't know how he justified his sin, and it doesn't really matter because in the end he changed the instructions of God, the result was disastrous, not only for him but for his fellow Israelites. Full preterism changes the entire gospel, even if it only changes one point, such as the resurrection. As a result, it changes the gospel as it was handed down, and the end is the same as Achan's. So if you're a full preterist, I urge you, do not defile the sacrament of communion. Because not only would it be inconsistent with your theology, but you have no business taking part in it. At least not until you re-examine your error and repent of changing the gospel once delivered to the saints. I'll say it again. Only Jesus Christ himself or God the Father has the authority to declare any alteration to the gospel in any way, shape, or form. And until then, we must preach it as it was handed to us. If you've taken it upon yourself to change the gospel in any way or to pass on an altered gospel, I say, repent, 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 please. Please, put this Jesuit heresy aside before it's too late. I want to make this clear. I'm not saying this because I hate preterists. I'm sure most of them have no clue of what they're doing. I know people who are preterists whom I dearly love. I'm just saying this because I hate full and fanatical preterism as Jewish perversions of the gospel. Now, I'm sure full and fanatical preterists will insist that they haven't changed the gospel, but every full preterist I've read takes everything written about the resurrection and the judgment, everything Christ and the apostles said and wrote on the topic, and applied it 100% 
100% to 70 AD. Not one example do they apply to any event after 70 AD. They have to do it that way if they're going to insist that all prophecy was fulfilled at that point, which means they've checked off those two events as past. The resurrection and the judgment, they're past and currently irrelevant, which means they're teaching a different gospel than the one that we read about in the New Testament. Now, futurism is bad, don't get me wrong. It's bad news on a multitude of levels. But at least it doesn't try to eliminate any of the points of Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. A person can believe the gospel and still be futurist or even a partial preterist, but to be full preterist, which logically demands that you eliminate at least two of the principles of the doctrine of Christ in order to be consistent, you have to make a choice between the faith once delivered to the saints and your chosen eschatology. You can't ride both horses or you're inconsistent. Once again, I'm running out of time, but hopefully I'll be wrapping this series up soon and moving on to other things. But in the meantime, just consider this. If God does not change, as it clearly states in Malachi 3.6, then his gospel will not change. Revelation 14.6 says the gospel is an everlasting gospel. That's Ionios, the same word used to describe everlasting life throughout the Gospels and Epistles and everlasting judgment in Hebrews 6.2. If the Gospel is everlasting, it's consistent, it's steady, it's unchanging, it's undying, and we need to warn anyone who teaches that it has changed at any point since Christ, 70 AD or otherwise, they're adding and taking away from the Word of God. They're anathema, they're accursed, and they need to repent Because in the case of the full and fanatical preterists, that judgment is coming, whether they believe it or not. 